behind these daily headlines lies the story of the men behind the flyers, the men who keep them flying. What's their story? Now, let's see. Take this advanced American aerodrome. Besides the pilots who fly these ships, let's have a look at the other highly trained soldiers who help to get the planes in the air and keep them there. It takes metal workers, welders, machinists, and mechanics to keep the motors turning. Weather observers to tell the pilots when they can take off. These and many others. Not so long ago, they'd never felt the weight of a GI shoe or the scratch of an OD shirt. Yet now, see how naturally they go about their routine jobs. Jobs without which no air combat mission can leave the ground. In life, he was already a mechanic. So, of course, there wasn't much of a problem assigning him to this work. Or in putting this man into radio. Because as plain John Citizen in the Acme Radio Repair Shop, he'd learned to do this job with his eyes shut. And this armor was prepared for his job in the Air Forces by... Uh-uh, what's this? This is just the point. Here's what your expert armorer was doing a few short months ago. And don't think he's any exception either to the daily classification problems of the technical training command. You take salesmen, soda clerks, entertainers. These men and thousands like them will become specialists at highly technical jobs. Looking for an opportunity, huh, Joe? Trying to fit yourself for something? Well, don't get any gray hairs worrying, son, because the Army will be taking that problem off your shoulders pretty soon now. It happens every day, starting at basic training centers like this. All these men have been in the Army a fast week and have been assigned to the Air Force for three whole days. They've just completed their preliminary examinations. You know, mathematics, mechanical movement, and aptitude tests, and are about to have individual interviews. With the men who are already skilled, the process of classification is comparatively easy. But it's quite a problem with the unskilled men. The fellows like, well, here's Joe again. Suppose we stick with him for a while and see how it's done. That's the list of schools in the technical training command. There's certainly a wide enough choice, isn't there, Joe? <laughs> Now, you men know that you have three schools to choose from. If possible, we try to give you a first choice. If we can't, then we try to give you a second choice. And if we can't do that, well, we hope that the third choice will be OK. But you'll find that out when you begin your individual interviews. Now, how about the tests you've been taking? They tell the interviewer what you are most capable of learning and indicate what job you might be best suited for. The tests are fair. Remember that. Our job here is to help you men. So here are a couple of friendly tips. The Army isn't trying to talk you into anything. That's why you have your choice of schools. But uh, don't take, for example, radio, simply because you fellas might have a, a girlfriend in Chicago and you think you're going to be sent to the Stevens Hotel. <laughs> and don't look for soft courses, because there are no soft courses in the Technical Training Command. If one job takes less brawn, it'll require more brains. And you can forget about the safe spots, too, because wherever our planes are fighting, you'll be there with them. And finally, bear in mind that the interviewers do care what happens to you. That's why they're here. So tell them the truth. And don't listen to a lot of cock and bull stories about how to get ahead in the Army. There's just one way, and that's work. Work hard for the duration in six months. All right, men, let's begin the interview. And... Summers, Joseph Albert, Christmas, Stuart, Daniel, Baker, Sierra. Sit down, Joe. Thanks. Cigarette? No, thanks. Relax, this is the end of the line. I've been wanting to ask a million questions, but I... I know, I know, and, and nobody would listen to you. Just wait a minute while I transfer these grades onto your Form 20. This form travels with you wherever you go in the Army, Joe. How did I make out on those tests? Pretty good, Joe. What did you do before you got into the Army? Oh, a little bit of everything, I guess. A uh, delivery clerk with the express company, uh, and a job at my uncle's leather goods factory. Handle any machinery there? No, just sort of a general helper. 
I didn't stay at the leather factory long, though. It spoiled my appetite for steaks. <laughs> and then uh, one summer I worked on a, on a riverboat, sort of a steward and a mess boy. But uh, that doesn't mean I wanted a permanent KP. No, I know, I know. I, um, I see here you're a high school graduate. Were you a good student? Oh, fair, you know, about the middle of the class. <laughs> Joe, uh, what did you want to do before the war came along? Frankly, I don't know. Just sort of marking time, eh? Sort of. <laughs> I see here that your, your hobby is gardening. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I put that in because when I got to thinking about it, I really didn't have a hobby. You know, the Army's had me doing a lot of thinking lately about things I can't do and things I don't know. It's that way with a lot of us, Joe. I was just about to get my teaching degree in college when I came in the Army. Well, I see that uh, photography is your first choice. Any particular reason? Well, to tell the truth, I, I don't know that either. When I saw that list of schools on the blackboard, I, I suddenly realized I didn't know a darn thing about any of those places. And, well, see, I, I used to take pictures with a little brownie camera of mine, but, but that's about as far as I ever got. Well, that's not quite far enough, Joe. The, the Army prefers professional photographers. They have an ample supply and more coming in every day. I think you better forget that one. Well, that's okay with me. Now, your next choice is clerk. Well, you Can see... You type? If I use the hunt and peck system, yes. <laughs> well, I use that myself, but that's not quite good enough for the Army. They prefer the touch system. <laughs> well, my uh, third choice is radio. I know what you're going to say because I've been trying to say it all along. I don't know what I'm doing in the Air Force in the first place. That's easy. You're here because the Air Force needs you. Now, we don't expect a man to fit into a job just one, two, three. That's why all these tests and applications and waiting, and that's the purpose of this interview. Now, I see by your grades that uh, you're good enough to go to radio school. But I don't know if I want to go to radio school. I just put that down because I had to choose three. <laughs> I guess I'm just a dumb guy who can't make up his mind. No, Joe, you're not a dumb guy. I can tell by talking to you, you're intelligent and you have the aptitude to study any one of a number of the subjects that are taught in those schools. But suppose I should decide on a school and... and you don't think I'm suited to go there? Well, then I'd have to pick one for you. But we'd rather that you made the choice. And if it's at all possible, the men get the choice. Well, we're right back where we started from. Because I don't know enough about these different schools to pick any one in particular. Besides, I, I didn't join the Army to go to school again. Heck, there's a war going on. Uh, if I were going to be a pilot or I something... I know, I know exactly what you mean. In the first place, you're not just going back to school again. You'll be trained for highly important combat duties. In the second place, that, uh, that pilot you spoke of, he couldn't even get off the ground if it weren't for the men in the technical training command. And in the third place... Well, maybe it'll be a little clearer if we take a look at this list of schools and see just what happens in each one. Now, if you pick airplane mechanics, for instance, here's the kind of school you'd be going to. That might be you, Joe, marching to class after morning chow. A regular school with, with classes? Well, it's not just books and paper. It's the real thing. You work with the actual parts, from propeller to rudder, from cylinder to bomb rack. Whatever it is, you touch it, you handle it, and that's how you learn. First, the name of your tools and how to use them. And second, the different parts of an airplane. The various systems which make a plane fly are taught on mock-ups or demonstrator boards, like this one of the electrical system, from which you progress to the actual installation of these systems on the planes themselves. The hydraulic system which operates the bomb bay doors, brakes, wing flaps, and landing gears, such as this one used on a big four-engine bomber. Boy, what a wheel. Imagine that when it hits the dirt. Here's where you learn about it, Joe. And see that man way over there on the right? Yes. Well, he knows more about fuel and oil systems and engine induction, and he can teach it to you, even though you do start from zero. And a mechanic doesn't just work on engines either. Far from it. You'll know every part of a plane. Take variable pitch propellers. They'll tell you just how they work. You'll learn how to break them down and down again until, see this? you get to the very core. And not just propellers either, but airplane structures such as wings, flaps, ailerons, and... 
After a student has the combined knowledge of airplane structure and engines, he uses it on all types of planes. Oh, I know that one. It's a P-40. That's right. It was fished out of the ocean, but it will fly again when these men are finished with it. Or here, big bombers like this B-25, or specialized jobs like this observation plane. Here's a motor on a testing block. The instructor has deliberately screwed it up. It's the mechanic's job to discover what's wrong and fix it, if they can stand up long enough. The Air Force figures, if they can pass this test, they can handle any problems that come up in actual combat, because that's where these boys are headed. And there are no instructors out there. That looks like the real thing. It is. On combat fields like this, you have to work fast, under tough conditions. But what of it? You're trained to get that plane in shape. The whole crew, bombardier, navigator, gunner, pilot, have faith in you, Joe. And when that plane hits the sky, it better be perfect. And it is. The mechanic isn't the only one at the combat field. The sheet metal worker has plenty to do. And to learn how, he starts off with mechanical drawing. He actually draws those blueprints. And that's how he learns to read them. Then he makes the actual parts from the blueprint, like this piece, part of the trailing edge of a wing. You learn about metal and all that stuff? Sure, you handle the metal yourself. Get the feel of the tools that mold and shape those hundreds of parts. Put them together, that spells airplane. You learn how to rivet fast. Those rivets hold the plane together. You learn to do electroplating to protect working parts against rust and corrosion the natural enemies of metal. You repair radiators that have flown thousands of miles, bounced up against machine gun slugs and enemy flak. You learn to take a few stitches in the plexiglass that protects the gunners and bombardiers. Not to mention plugging up those bullet holes in the fuselage itself. Next time they're doing this, it may be on a combat field anywhere from Egypt to Alaska. Oh, of course, you, you never get this many bullet holes from real enemy fire. These are just practice sections that, uh, I beg your pardon. Those are the real thing, made by Jap bullets. You've got to keep on your toes on a combat field, because you never know what'll happen. Yeah, I see what you mean. Uh-huh. One more job for the ground crew, including the metal worker. That plane must be repaired in a hurry. She's got plenty of fighting still ahead. Boy, the metal worker sure sees action all right. And the welder. He's the metal worker's pal and buddy. He handles the hot stuff. And Joe, it's hot. The welder, being part of the team, naturally has got to learn the properties of different metals. But most of his time is spent in getting right down to actual welding. The more he's done, the better he'll be. By the time a fellow has completed the welding course, he knows the two types. Acetylene, and that's the process of gas welding and brazing, welding with electric arc. This welder may have to repair a gas tank that's been badly hit. He has to be plenty careful. Some pilot's gonna need that gas. And while he's working at that job, another man, the airplane machinist, has learned to make a whole new part for that tank. And now, does it fit? Perfect. With the machinist's work related to the welder and metal worker, it's obvious that he too be trained in maintenance, supplies, and mechanical drawing. But soon you're using these machines yourself. Machines that make vital parts for planes. Lathes, grinding machines, milling machines, shapers. And here's another thing, the process of heat treating metals. That gauge reads over 1,500 degrees. Yep. And when the metal is nice and warm, you'll quench it, plunge it into a liquid to cool. This process is called tempering. It hardens the metal. Now, if you think those machines that you've seen so far have been big, just take a look at these jobs. And by the time a soldier finishes his course at machinist school, he can operate every one of those big babies. Man, that's a skill you can always use, even after the scrap's over. Yes, Joe. That's true of every job in the technical training command. See this part? It has to be accurate to one ten-thousandth of an inch, or else. 
Yes, sir. A pilot must know that his ship can take it. Boy, look at that baby go. And who put her up there? The mechanic, the metal worker, the welder, the machinist. They're only part of a big team. These are the men who actually handle the planes. But the Air Force needs thousands of others, skilled technicians. Can't get along without them. Take teletype, for instance. That's the real nerve system of the Army. Right in this school, you learn how to adjust and how to take care of that teletype machine. It's just a typewriter, plus. But that plus means electrical wiring. You take them apart, and now, can you put them back together again without any pieces left over? Yes, you can. That's what they teach you here. And you don't have to be Superman to learn it either. Then, of course, the teletype maintenance man can also learn how to operate his machine, thus make himself a mighty important man at any airbase. On his skill depends the speed and accuracy with which vital commands are transmitted. Now, take this message. What's that? That's code, Joe. Combat stuff. Supplies needed at the front. And here they are. These urgently needed supplies and equipment. And there's an Air Corps supply clerk, an important guy if there ever was one. He makes sure that the right item gets to the right spot at the right time. And he learned all that back at school. Learned to type 35, 40 words a minute. And that's good. Just like all the other schools, you learn by actually doing the job. Offices are reproduced just as they are at a regular air base. Here's operations, a room the pilots visit every day before taking off. Here's the orderly room, top sergeant and all. This is a typical Air Corps supply room, completely stocked from handkerchiefs to blankets. But a clerk, those boys really get to see much action? Take a look, Joe. Here's a clerk typing a message, a message that starts a whole air attack. Message delivered, clerk to radio man. And the enemy's gonna get that message, compliments of the U.S. Army Air Forces. And working right in the middle of that action and every action are the radio boys. They start right here. With this expert instruction, many a man discovers he has an aptitude for radio work. And for all those radio hams, this is a real chance to become a professional. You'll learn right here how to send and receive international Morse code. Someday you may tap out words that will become immortal. Sighted sub, sank same. Ever hear that, Joe? Here you learn the principles of the loop antenna, or directional finder. And when you're out somewhere over the ocean, your gas supply running low, overcast so thick you can't see two feet ahead of you, then every man on that plane relies on you, the radio operator. And in order to get home safely, you'll rely on what you learned back in school. On this bench is the complete communication system you'll find every time you get into one of those bombers. You'll learn procedure radio phone and telegraph, and a lot of it's secret. You'll find mock-ups or demonstrative boards in radio too, just as in the other schools. The radio man gets to know each individual part so that he can easily recognize trouble in the completely assembled set, like this one. Then when something goes wrong, radio man can take it apart, start troubleshooting, and put the set together again. Now those messages can get through. This is just practicing radio communications on the ground but it's exactly as if these men were in flight in an element of B-17s. The actual flying conditions are reproduced, even to the cold weather these radio men will soon experience on the big bombers. Gunnery school is a must for radio operators, mechanics, and armorers, provided they're physically fit. And brother, if you're looking for action, this is it. A chance to fly and get your hands on those 50 caliber machine guns. You have eight flying missions and plenty of aerial gunnery not to mention taking care of your own equipment. And when you graduate, you're a real part of the Army Air Forces, with a buck sergeant's rating and a pair of those silver wings. This is it, Joe, somewhere overseas. That's a chap zero. Well, it was. And the fellows who knocked it down graduated from gunnery school not so long ago. That bomber up there is a long way from home. It's almost nighttime. There's no radio beam in this territory. The pilot will depend on his knowledge of blind flying to get that ship back safely. And he first learned how to do this from a link trainer instructor. These link trainers look like sawed-off airplanes, don't they? But right here in this hangar, men are taught to fly by instruments. 
Let's watch this instructor put a pilot through his paces. He's telling him to center the needle, center the ball. That's to keep the plane straight and level. This recorder traces the pilot's path in flight and enables the instructor to show him when he goes off course. The link instructor learns navigation, radio range orientation, meteorology, air traffic regulations. And since these trainers are in use day and night, and when you're the know how to keep it in perfect working order. So you see, Joe, it's in these funny looking little ships nailed to the ground that a pilot really learns to fly in all sorts of weather. When the going is tough, and the pilot can't see beyond the windshield in front of him, he thanks his lucky stars he had a good link trainer instructor. And speaking of weather, here's another school in the technical training command that works directly with pilots and navigators. Believe it or not, we've got all kinds of weather in this room. Fog, rain, hail, sleet, snow. Only it's all down on charts, luckily for the soldiers who are taking this course. But weather observer school doesn't keep you in the classroom. You learn to use the instruments that make those weather charts possible. You learn how to repair those instruments right out in the field. Now this tank measures rainfall. Those gadgets being swung around back there are sling psychrometers. No, no, I don't get the idea those boys are in their second childhood playing around with toy balloons. These and all the other complicated instruments, foreign as they may seem to you now, are easily understood once you get the hang of it. Who, what's that guy doing there, the one climbing up the ladder in the back? He's repairing an anemometer, which measures wind velocity. Meanwhile, these pilot balloons are inflated with hydrogen and carefully balanced to achieve the proper buoyancy, which varies from day to day according to existing air pressure. Pilot balloons are sent into the upper levels of the atmosphere to determine the direction and velocity of the wind. You follow the ascent of the balloons through these theodolites. You measure how fast they go at a certain height, and that's how fast the wind is moving. From these calculations, wind aloft charts are plotted. They're a must for every pilot in preparing flight plans. They show him how to dodge the bad storms and get into favorable tailwinds. So you see, Joe, what a big part the weather observer plays in keeping those pilots flying safely. And speaking of safety, that's where the parachute rigger comes into his own. Ever figure the time and patience and care that goes into a parachute? Take a look. Basic instruction begins with the making and packing of parachutes. And not just chutes either, but all sorts of flotation equipment and aircraft clothing. Men with experience in tailoring and handling of fabrics would do well at this work. Packing a chute is the most delicate and precise sort of job. And the rigger must constantly bear in mind that every crease, every fold, every shroud line must be in exactly the right position. Here's how you test your handiwork. See how easily it opens? if it's been packed correctly. Of course, if this chute isn't packed right, this man can always get down off the table. But how about this man? Mm-hmm. Good packing job. Now, these men happen to be paratroopers, so they pack their own chutes. But for everyone else in the Air Force, who may have to come down suddenly, You'll pack the chutes. Parachutes are not only used for saving men's lives, but also in the delivery of vital equipment and military information. Strategic photographs like these are dropped by parachute. They're a bird's eye view of enemy operations, and intelligence wants them at headquarters in a hurry. So a jeep picks them up and rushes them to the laboratory for... And that takes us back to you and your Kodak, Joe. When you see what they do in this school, Perhaps you'll realize why using a brownie camera isn't quite enough. You've got to learn optics, how light bends when it goes through a lens, or how it hits the sensitized film and what happens there, how that image is developed and fixed, when to use plates, when to use roll film. You get to be a military photographer. You learn how to take care of your cameras, for these are your weapons. The final work is done in the photographic laboratory. You learn the basic chemistry of photography. You learn how to print pictures that contain vital information for Air Force intelligence. And how to bring those pictures to life in the developer. Pictures taken in high altitude flight are enlarged so that by this aid, you can become familiar with every detail of foreign terrain. And when you've become proficient as a laboratory technician, you go out into combat zones in portable labs like these. 
or you go on to get your wings as an aerial photographer. Day or night on reconnaissance flights high over enemy territory, he can bring back his photos. He does it by dropping a flare bomb, then covering the area in a series of overlapping pictures. These pictures are rushed to advanced laboratories. Skilled technicians put them together like jigsaw puzzles. The final mosaic is used by intelligence and shows them what to bomb and where. X marks the spot. This information is taken to the bombers along with enough dynamite to wipe it off the map. Dynamite, Joe. That's the armorer's job. An armorer, as you probably know, handles all the guns and bullets and bombs and cannon and other weapons that our planes carry. When you come right down to it, a, a plane is just a flying gun. At armorer's school, you'll get to know how to repair and service those guns and cannon, and how to handle bombs and shells and belts of ammunition. Classroom work is mainly devoted to handling the guns themselves. The most important weapon used in our bombers and pursuit ships is the 50 caliber machine gun. That's why so much time is taken to instruct men in their operation and, and maintenance. Men with hunting as a hobby should do well in this. They'll have a chance to bag the biggest game of their lives. Here's an instructor demonstrating to the students how the 37 millimeter cannon functions. Are those bullets? Hmm. Those are baby shells, Joe. And when those shells hit, goodbye, Jap. They call this the malfunction laboratory. Sort of like final exams, Joe. Students are tested to see how quickly they can locate the trouble on machine guns that have jammed or gone haywire. Another job for the armorer is to make sure that machine guns are synchronized perfectly to fire through the propeller. One slip up in installing any of these guns, you'd save the Germans and the Japs a lot of trouble because your pilot would find himself shooting up his own propeller. Now watch this, Joe. That's the top turret of a big bomber. Two guns go in there. But that's only one turret. Underneath, where you least expect it, there's another pair of deadly twins. 50 caliber machine guns. Nothing soft about that, Belly. That's what makes a fortress a fortress. OK for the small stuff. Here are the bombs. You learn how they're released from racks and all types of bombers. These are just practice bombs. But these aren't. From the time you receive them from ordnance and load them on the truck to be driven to the plane is only a matter of minutes. If you're an armorer, you place them carefully in the bomb racks. And you know that those bombs and bullets are going to be delivered on time and where they'll do the most good. You see, Joe, these men started from zero just like you. And yet today, they can send a bomber squadron on its deadly mission. Because it takes more than pilots, Joe, to fly those ships. It takes men like you, and you, and you. Men who have been trained. Men who can look up into the sky and say, that's my plane. Yes, that's my plane. You, you're the men who keep them flying. Well, Joe, you think you'll be able to make up your mind now? And how, mister? How about you fellas? Well, how about you fellas? Listen to what your commanding general has to say. Not very many years ago, I knew almost every man in the Air Forces personally. That is impossible today. There are almost two millions of us, but I know you by reputation. It's a good reputation, and it's been won the hard way by your brothers fighting in the field. You have a tough job ahead. As graduates of the Technical Training Command, the performance of a fighting ship depends as much on you as it does on the pilot, the navigator, the bomber, or the gunner. You'll spend long hours sweating out your ship. Yours is the responsibility for getting her there and bringing her back with no faults in the mechanics of the flight. Learn all you can. You'll need every bit of knowledge you can acquire to keep our great new ships flying. You are the men we depend on. It's a pleasure for me to welcome you personally into the Army Air Force.